Drew Mack, founder of Outdoor Afro, uh, and Sir Tim Smith, uh, the founder of the Eden Project, who really are just two of the best, um, most fun, <laughs> most interesting um, thinkers and speakers and doers, critically, when it comes to the environment and, uh, and conservation. So we're going to we're in for a treat. Uh, I certainly am anyway. Um, and uh, but this event has been brought to us in partnership with our friends at the Bergruen Institute. And so I just want to hand over to our friend Rachel at the Bergruen Institute just to, to say a few words. Thanks so much, Rohan. And thanks, everybody, for connecting here today. Uh, we're delighted at the Bergeron Institute to be part of um, this wonderful series with Second Home. And we also know how important biodiversity is to them. So, um, uh, so much, so big thanks to Rohan for, um, you know, for having a lot of fun and coming up with uh, these conversations. And I think today is just a really a product of um, that kind of collaboration that we have uh, that is so unique and um, it allows us to bring different worlds together that you might not um, normally um, hear from. And um, I think where the beauty of these two speakers today comes in is that they're both joyful revolutionaries and uh, we're truly um, in awe of their work um, because I think it inspires wonder and uh, curiosity and also um, sparks the flame for education and for learning and uh, for human interconnectedness with our world and our planet. Um, the Institute, we're uh, really an ideas-based organization. We're a think action tank, I think is what you could call it. Uh, we're here to develop and nurture ideas that will create a, a more, um, a better future. Um, so our work really is focused in broadly on looking at the, the big transformations that are, hu are affecting hu humanity and climate is certainly one of them. Um, and we can't talk about climate without talking about biodiversity. So thanks so much for, for uh, joining us here today. Awesome. Well, look, without Without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Rue Mapp and Tim Smith. So Rue, um, I'm going to have a crack at introducing Rue, but her CV and bio is so impressive and so long, it would probably take about 40 minutes to read, <laughs> read through it all. But in a, in a nutshell, founder and CEO of Outdoor Afro, which is America's leading network celebrating and inspiring black connections and leadership in, in nature. It's a non-profit, not-for-profit non organization with leadership networks around the country. Is that fair? -ish? Yes, uh, great. And, Thank you it, so much. <laughs> you've got a very good website. And, um, but the, the um, you know, Rue has been, as, as many of you tuning in will know, has been celebrated, fated by Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, Oprah Winfrey called in on her recent uh, national national tour. So, you know, people adore Rue and with good reason because of the impact she's she's having. Uh, Tim is an old drinking buddy of mine, but he has done more with his life than than just just that. Tim Tim Smith is really one of my one of my heroes, and he. Uh, as, as many of you tuning in will know, he discovered, in inverted commas, and, and then uh, restored the Lost Gardens of Heligan in Cornwall, a, a beautiful, beautiful garden, um, and then went on to create one of the eighth wonders of the world, as it's, as it's known, the Eden Project, a collection of amazing biodomes in, uh, in Cornwall, in the south of England. And if, if you've never seen it, Google it now, look it up. But it's, you know, 30, the size of 30 football pitches, uh, the Eden Project. And it is just the most incredible beacon for education, uh, for, for the environment, for conservation. Um, and, and Tim has a, an incredible agenda, which he's going to achieve, of opening Eden Projects around the world in every continent uh, uh, over the next over the next few years it's, it's an amazing agenda and he's gonna he's gonna do it so look so we're, we're gonna spend about half an hour uh, I'm gonna abuse the hell out of my chair's prerogative and ask questions um, uh, if, if anyone gets boring I'm gonna make a sort of loud cockatoo squeal uh, but you're not gonna hear that from me but that's uh, just something I do um, but I, let me let's kick off with asking asking you Rude tell, tell us about starting outdoor afro what was the what was the inspiration uh for for, for that leap 
Well, it was just this moment um, where I was ready to answer a question that I think everyone should ask or answer at some time in their life. I had a mentor who asked me on the verge of me going away to business school, which was going to be a pretty hard endeavor. And she asked me, you know, Rue, if time and money were not an issue, what would you be doing? And I opened my life, mouth and my life just fell right on out. I said, I'd probably start a website to reconnect Black people to the outdoors. And we both, you know, had a moment of being taken aback, but that was absolutely my truth. And it was my truth because I grew up in a nature loving family who had a ranch that they treasured about a hundred miles north of our home in Oakland. And we had cows and we had pigs. And I had this relationship with my local Creek and I was a girl scout. And then I was also an early adapter of, of technology. And I was coding at the age of 11 years old. And I had my first Commodore 64 around that time. And so there are all of these really incredible streams that I just took for granted. You know, it was just like the ABCs of me, you know, the things that you cast aside and you put in the hobby category were actually the things that mattered the most to me. And that I could see that more people who look like me needed to have the benefits of those experiences. Mm -hmm. So after that conversation, Outdoor Afro was born and I started that blog on my heart, just writing about all of my experiences growing up. And in the beginning, when it was the early days of social media and the algorithms were nice and flat, I was able to have this wonderful dialogue with people from my kitchen table who let me know that they love nature too. And so Outdoor Afro set out to really help shift the visual representation of who we imagine gets outside, but also leads in the outdoors. And we've continued to listen to our community. And now we're present in 30 states and our participation network is all over 45,000 people. So right. definitely a long ways away from that blog and, and still more storyline to go. And you know, half the audience tuning in is from Europe, half half from America, which is which is really cool, but particularly for the Europeans tuning in, but but everyone, you know, tell us a bit about why you felt it was it was so important, you know, about to do with the history perhaps of kind of the black experience in America and the interaction with nature, why this was so necessary for you. Yes, you know, there are two narratives when it comes to black people in a narrative in America. One is one of triumph, of being connected to nature and having a deep, wonderful relationship with nature that was in service of how we lived our daily lives. And then there's this other part of the narrative that really speaks to the violence on the black body in the outdoors. When I was little, I remember asking my dad, uh, when I just learned about the story of Emmett Till, uh, a Chicago young man who had been brutalized uh, in the South while visiting relatives. And I was just so taken by that story that I asked my dad, did you ever know anyone who'd been lynched? And he said, all the time. Mm -hmm. So we have a living generational memory of people who associate horror with trees we can turn to the plaintive lyrics of Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit, blood from the trees, blood on the root. And so I felt it was important for us to really tap into the histories of triumph, thinking about figures such as Harriet Tubman, who absolutely is a wilderness leader, who helped people in the cover of night get through nature on the other side to freedom. Absolutely people in our families are people who have held up a, a narrative of, of connection to nature. And so Outdoor Afro really set out to find healing and atonement, but also tell the new narrative and tell the narrative of the persistence to use nature and for black people to be represented in nature as strong, beautiful, and free. Amazing, so good. Uh, Tim, you know, for you, um, you know, the Eden Project came sort of hot on the heels of of, of Heligan. But and, and when I sort of when, when I sort of think of biodomes in Cornwall, I sort of think, oh yeah, that that makes sense. But at the time, it was a, absolutely you know such a such a leap of, of faith. I mean, considering how successful it's been, nineteen million plus visitors, one point nine billion pounds. Uh, you know, two billion dollars plus of, of of impact in local community. But where did it where did it come from? The vision of 
of biodomes in a far-flung bit of, of England? Well, um, to be honest, I'd love to say something as erudite as Rue just had. Uh, the truth, though, is um, I love kissing frogs. I've <laughs> always loved kissing frogs. I have always loved the idea that something that feels damaged or broken or ugly is just a touch away from being marvellous. And that's why I fell in love with the Lost Gardens of Heligan, as you know. It, was, it had been derelict for 70 years and I just felt that we could restore it. And it was there that I learned something really interesting, which is if you have a story that's powerful enough and that uses language which belongs to all of us as opposed to highfalutin language, um, suddenly you find alongside you so many people. We had loads of volunteers came along and a project which institutions said would cost about 40 million to restore. We did it for 450,000 pounds. And it was just brilliant. It was there that I learned the power of storytelling because I, I had to take children uh, from the schools and tell them how exciting the project was. And for two days, they found me the most boring man they'd ever met. And I was so stressed that I was considering uh, claiming I was sick for the third day. And I just came in on that third day and I suddenly knew what to say. And I told them about poisons and how they would die. And I threatened them with plants and they were mine. They were completely mine. They suddenly started to look at every hedgerow in a completely new way. And I suddenly realized that if I got rid of all the Latin and all of the class ridden stuff to do with plants and just said, look, these things can't sing and they can't dance, but they're utterly sensational. Um, I was amazed that, that, that youngsters started to find it exciting. So I started to think, well, what if I could make people who weren't interested in this stuff interested, how about we go really big and really derelict? And I found this um, clay mine, a 34 acre hole in the ground um, that was being poisoned by minerals as well. And I, I said to myself, you know what, if we can bring life to this place and show how clever human beings can be, it will be a beacon of some kind of hope. And you know, it, it turned out like that. It was a story uh, that was based on hope, but more than anything, um, it was based on the realization that I hated environmentalists. I, <laughs> I am called an environmentalist, I know, but whenever I'm accompanied by people who are professional environmentalists, I normally feel slightly ill because of the sense of the waggy fingered Old Testament prophet like sanctimony you're expecting about how we're all screwing the world up. And I've never ever changed my opinion when anybody shouted at me or told me everything I did was wrong. I've changed my behavior many, many times when people have said, have you thought of this? This could be really, really cool. Yeah. Also, I think it's really important and, and Rue has just demonstrated it so marvelously. It's really important that people who are interested in these subjects sound as if they live in the real world. And they're not trying to stop everybody doing things. They're trying to open up opportunities. And for me, the biggest thing was to prove that an environmentalist did not have to be stereotypically a moosely weaving, open-toed sandal, smelling of patchouli oil type person who couldn't do a business plan. I'm actually a capitalist. And I believe that what's wrong with capitalism is simply that too few people practice it with a moral compass. And for me, the whole of the Eden Project was an exercise in creating symbols of hope and also showing that people could do big. I love big. I, look, I, I so love everything you just said. And there's actually, I'm gonna quote Tim back to himself. There's a brilliant thing Tim once said. He said, um, um, the great thing about the Eden Project is it demonstrates once and for all that sustainability is not about sandals and nut cutlets. It's about good business practice and the citizenship values of the future, which I think is so, is so great. I mean, Rue, on this on this point, you know, we we are at a real um, junction for you know our relationship with life on Earth. You know, we're on course to lose fifty percent of all species by the end of the century. You know, there is this looming, genuine biodiversity apocalypse kind of looming. How do you think we should, you know, as a as a community, as a as a as a group, as a um, as a species? Um, said about bringing about that kind of mindset change you know what for you is going to be key to us as us winning this winning this battle well thank you rohan um it, that is absolutely a holy grail question and i answer it the same way every time and that is nothing will happen faster than the speed of relationships mm. 
Here in, in the United States, we have black children who drown at five times the rate of white children. This is our inheritance of Jim Crow policies that had signs up that blacks could not go into this pool or be on this public beach. And so we have people who are not only dying, but I know that if a young person doesn't know how to swim or is afraid of water, they're never going to ease into a tippy kayak. They're never going to put a pole in a glassy lake and they sure as hell are not going to care about plastic in the ocean. Mm. So we really have to start with helping people have a relationship with their spaces. And that's what I love about the Eden Project. I love what we're creating all over the country with outdoor Afro leadership, because there are three words that, you know, to your point, Tim, you know, we miss in this, this world of environmentalism or conservation, and that's joy, love, and fun. Yeah. And, and, and that's what I feel in this time, we actually need to double down on because this work for me is a love story. It's a love of community. It's a love of connection. It's a love of places. Um, and I know that people are not going to get into the action of, of protecting a place if they don't have a relationship with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this, coming up, you know, if we were a bunch of uh, patchouli smelling environmentalists, we might have talked by now about that there's the G20 summit coming up. There's going to be a big UN conference on biodiversity in China. How, how do the two of you think about those kinds of, you know, do you think for you, real action is going to be local, it's going to be sort of bottom up? How do you think we ought to, ought to sort of engage, if at all, with these kinds of big international um, uh, jamborees? I mean, Tim, what, what's, your, what's your take on those kind of get togethers? And what, if anything, we should be doing to try and move them? Obviously, we should try and move them. I think it's very easy to be cynical. And I slap myself around the face once a day at the tendency to become cynical because it's important that we realize that the people we're talking about are actually people with names, with families. And part of the thing is that we often talk about institutions. And I think we need to break down the notion of institution and see it as a collection of individuals who each should be taking a degree of responsibility. What I think is so um, uplifting about what Rue is saying about uh, outdoor leadership is that one of the thoughts that has been expressed by actually a number of influential thinkers about the problem in our society is that we have no rites of passage anymore. We go to school, we come out, and we're still kids. There's no, no, there's, there's no sense of having to take responsibility. So people don't take responsibility. And I think outdoor leadership has always been, if you like, the brokering area for people to actually suddenly realize that they are now adults and uh, it matters. And what you say matters, what you do matters. You are judged by the responsibilities you take. Um, I'd love to hear Rue's views on this because I think, I think we use words like democracy nowadays and the truth is they sound rather hollow in our mouths because I think we're all realizing that the word um, now seems to mean no more than everybody's got a vote. It doesn't mean that we're all educated or that we have a position to take responsibility. And I think, I think the revolution that is necessary, is necessary is in terms of us being, uh, taking the leadership role in terms of our planet, um, uh, but, but also realizing that this isn't iterative. The crisis coming towards us genuinely requires leadership. In 20 years from now, we will have gone past a point uh, that it's going to be easy for us to hand over to the generation of your kids, for example, um, and feel proud about what we've got. We've still, it, we've still got a future to make, but we've got to become more unreasonable. All of us have got to become more unreasonable and not talk about, let's all do this by consensus. If people are poisoning the oceans, call it out. If people are actually trashing the land, call it out. If they're poisoning the air, call it out. It's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous for us not to realize that now is the time to prove that we are the stuff that's you know, worth saving or else we're gonna be like dinosaurs and we had a choice. 
Rue, I mean, you've you've you know you've been invited by Barack Obama to participate, Michelle Obama. You know, you've 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 been involved in the highest levels of of government with the governor of California as well. I mean, how do you think we uh, should, as a as a kind of people, engage with these big kind of macro kind of policy um, you know conversations? Well, I think one of the big challenges um, of the you know, the United States environmental movement um, is that it transactionalized its, it, its connections with people. Um, it became all about taking the poor children out to the wilderness to have some weekend transformational experience that would suddenly and magically turn them into conservationists. But really connections to nature, and we talked about this briefly before we went live, that having education throughout your entire life that comes from both the school environment, but also from your home environment. Because what Outdoor Afro is really trying to do is to help restore a sense of outdoor leadership and relationship and ownership back to the home. And I'm sorry, no one conference is going to achieve that. Mm -hmm. And so we have to really rethink the outdoors and we have to rethink what it means to really engage communities. And instead of looking at communities as needing to be led someplace, that we should look at what assets and contributions they have to contribute. Um, because when you, sit, when you sit down, even with the grandparents in your family, the environmental know-how, which I call outdoor swagger, it just oozes out of these lived experiences. And so I feel like we have to create more multi-generational opportunities for learning. And we really have to give ourselves permission to have informed imagination as it relates to the outdoors. Yes, give people the data, give people the, 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 the statistics, right? But trust people to know what it is they need to make their lives better, their communities better. And that starts at a very local level. We saw it during the pandemic. People mm. flooded the streets, uh, uh, they, they flooded the, the trails, they flooded the outdoors everywhere, right? Being the animals that we are, knowing that the source of our healing, whether it be physical or mental was available in those spaces. And it didn't take getting on a plane and going overseas or going to an iconic park hundreds of miles from your home. People were discovering their backyards and backyard gardens have taken off. And so we have to really get into the assets that people bring, their, their nature intelligence, and, um, and really build from there. Something that I feel has much more durability than this top-down, uh, you should, uh, Tim's uh, waggling finger example, um, just simply turns people off. Yeah. No, I need to. I need to do less of that. Um, but the, the Tim uh, Rue brought up um, COVID and and lockdown, and you know she's absolutely right. You know, near my house in LA, we live near a big sort of canyon park thing, and it's packed the whole time. It didn't used to be. Um, how do you think this is something? You know, never let a good crisis go to waste, and all that. Do you think it is something that we can sort of capital? It can be capitalized on. Could there be a new normal in terms of people being? out in nature and seeing the benefits of it? Or do you think we're kind of going to go back to the old old crappy crappy ways, um, you know, once and if there's a, there's a vaccine? I, I don't think we're going to go back to the old crappy ways. I think almost every single person I know across backgrounds feels that they were almost waiting for this. They mm -hmm. wanted it in a funny way. They didn't want the individual pain of it to those who've suffered, but they... It's hard to imagine, I'm sure that Rue and I uh, would agree, as we do on many things, that the, um, the COVID pandemic has done one thing that neither of us could have done probably in 30 years. In one sweep, it has shown the world that it's connected, completely interconnected, and you can't deny it. And that is a really powerful thing. The, the people that I think, or the, the things that are, I'm really glad for pangolins, by the way, I think it's terrific news, COVID, because pangolins are now not allowed to be slaughtered in public wet markets in China, um, and they are very rare. But talking about China, where we work, we've got three projects in China. I don't know whether many of the people listening here have been watching, but the transformation in China has been utterly astonishing. 
in terms of the awareness and the public policy now of making the environment the number one thing. I mean, absolutely, we're, we're working a project in Qingdao where uh, our partners there are a, a state um, a state owned enterprise and they have literally over the last year uh, been told and are now telling uh, that uh, all of the workforce, all of the people working uh, in their company and subcontractors have got to go into intensive nature education and projects are going to be monitored for their impact on the land. And President Xi says, um, heal the soil and you'll heal our souls. Regardless of your politics, regardless, regardless, it is a good thing that there is leadership that is actually recognizing that this could take place. I think it's also very interesting that one of the big conversations in China is about America and its embrace of um, what's called the clean meat revolution, you know, the non uh, the non meat uh, revolution and how uh, China may well embrace this big style because of course it built on uh, most of its great farmland on the east and a lot of the remaining farmland has got livestock on it. And you know where the food that um, feeds the Chinese livestock comes from? Brazil, soy from Brazil. Um, so we could see an extraordinary thing that an American pioneering and uh, invention gets taken up culturally by China, which in return then saves the rainforest. How ironic could that be? Yeah. And again, speak to that interconnectedness that you were yeah. describing. Another point of that interconnectedness, Ru, is, is, is the role of business. And something Tim and I have been talking about, and we're planning a whole series of things at, at Second Home, of which this will be the first on this, on this challenge of engaging business and entrepreneurs in, in, in this agenda. Is that something you've thought much about in, in your work? And, you know, clearly in America, American life, you know, corporate power is, 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 is pretty, pretty fundamental. How do you think about that question of engaging maybe small businesses particularly in this, in, this, in this conversation? Yeah, I think that we're in such a wonderful moment. And I know that some of it's tied to the, the raised awareness of, of, of nature and the need for connections to nature. And I live in the San Francisco Bay Area and there are some fantastic models for how people are using business as a platform to help people get outside. Um, and, and really work outside of the bureaucracies that actually end up doing the opposite of what they, they should be doing in terms of people's connection to the outdoors. One great example uh, local to me is when um, the parks were closed uh, because of the need for people to quarantine, yet people still wanted and needed to get outside. Um, yeah. there's, there's a business called Hip Camp um, that was basically a platform created to help private landowners make their lands available for people to camp on them. And mm. so you have this, this wonderful business case for how we can not only support these farmers who could use the additional income and vineyards, but also helping people to connect directly, often very locally, to opportunities to get outside even when park gates are shut. So I think we have some incredible examples. And Outdoor Afro, you know, we've been entrepreneurial from the start. It made a lot of sense for us to, to structure ourselves as a not-for-profit. But one of the things I've been careful not to do is to adapt the poverty mindset that I think often gets associated with not-for-profit organizations. And so it's been an incredible um, and central value to run a healthy, strong, scalable business. And so because of that, I was thankful that, especially over these last several months, you know, people have turned to Outdoor Afro, they've come out in droves to support us. And they, because of the reputation and because we do exactly what we say we're going to do and we have some incredible results and outcomes, um, you know, people, people want to get on board. And so I think we have a responsibility, even as not for-profit social enterprises, to really lift up the business acumen uh, and, and make sure that we are credible, um, not only in the social good, but also in the business good. So yeah. good. Such a cool example, the, uh, uh, the private farmland for, for camping. Brilliant.
Tim, you've thought a lot about this too, of, of course. I mean, and, and the Eden Project, for those of you who don't know, is set up as a social enterprise and a charity. So, you, you know, right from the beginning, you've been thinking about both sides. But this broader point of engaging and, and, and trying to shift business uh, operations. I mean, how do you think, we, how do you sort of think about that challenge? Or opportunity, I should say. I think, okay, the honest answer, I think governments the world over have been shamefully weak in creating a structure of law to enforce situations where capital has to operate in the long term and is not to throw away because they don't seem to realize there is no away. There is no away. And uh, one of uh, America's um, most brilliant sons, Bill McDonough, um, who wrote Cradle to Cradle, uh, he, he says it really, really well uh, about, he said, if someone told you that your relationship was sustainable, tell me, how excited are you? <laughs> this, this goes back to Rue's point about joy and beauty. We ought to expect those sort of good behaviours. It, it's really quite childish that we're talking about the corporate world as if they were all baby eaters. We just need, we could cure a lot of this pretty easily by putting in legislation which rewards very significantly long-term interest, things that have yeah. got a long-term interest and punishes things which actually affect, uh, if you like, requiring a discount from future generations. I am, I'm passionate about business because it is through the taxation of business we get the finances to be able to look after those who are less able to look after themselves. And I think we, we need to be honest about what business is capable of doing. And at the same time, I'm shocked at how poorly businesses work together to create plans which enable the communities in which they are to grow alongside them. The biggest thing I learned, uh, I learned when we built Eden was I went to a really big site in Wales, which had not been a great success. And I was so lucky. I met the two civil servants who... Uh, had been in charge of it and they were sad but they were brave enough to tell me everything they'd done wrong and I tell you what if they hadn't been brave enough to share their mistakes with me we might well have made some of those mistakes ourselves and the greatest mistake was that they made was that if you're going to have a giant adventure and do something marvelous tell everybody about it and how they can get involved in it really early on because if you tell them just before you're about to go no one can gear up and become part of it and actually you they can't use it as a a springboard for all sorts of other things so i think you know what, what Ru is saying is absolutely brilliant and i'm really hoping that um, on the back of having been introduced here we can work together because boy do we need that in the uk and i would feel really honored to have um Ru advise us in a big way and partner us to do stuff like this very exciting. I'm delighted. Regardless of whether there was an audience tonight, just meeting Rue uh, <laughs> oh, has been worth the turning feeling, up. The feeling is mutual. You know, and I don't know if you know this, um, and I've shared in a really limited way, but one of the big goals that I have is for Outdoor Afro to have a land-based home place. Because while we, you know, we love our, our public lands and we create and curate opportunities for people to bond with land and one another and our our histories in these places, um, you know, we, we, we want something more, you know, a place where we can have real retreat, we could bio blitz it, um, we could learn more deeply about culture, about the culture of, of the land, but of the people of the land, and be a place that's welcoming to everyone and racism free. Oh. So I would, I would love to dream with you um, about that possibility, knowing that you you, you have an eye to expand around the world. And uh, I think there's a lot we could learn from one another. Well, we all need to learn, you know? I mean, one of the things that is extraordinary, if you were to ask me what I think are the most damaging things in the world, they're middle-aged men. It's middle-aged men who are so certain and smug about the way the future should go. And we just don't listen enough. I mean, we, you know, I think that we ought to, um, part of the revolution has got to be for most of us to just shut up a while. <laughs> Well, that's a that's a good prompt actually. For we're gonna we're gonna open up to to Q and A's in just a sec. So if anyone's got any questions, do do post them. I've seen seen a bunch already, but do do fire in any questions. I'm just gonna ask a, a, a last a last sort of point, which is, um, 
the the sort of biodiversity um, issue in the sense over the last sort of 10, 20 years has been um, secondary to kind of the climate change kind of battle. And these things are obviously deeply interlinked, of course. But, you know, a lot of the ways in which um, some people are advocating we tackle climate change, um, planting monocultural forests and so on, maybe aren't very good for biodiversity. And you can imagine a world in which we end up being zero carbon, but actually we have lost uh, many of the world's ecosystems and species and things. So, you know, the biodiversity challenge is, in a sense, even harder than the climate change one. I'm just wondering how, how you sort of think about this, um, you know, Rue, the where you place climate change in your sort of conversations with communities and where you think it ought to sort of sit in the hierarchy of, of engaging people's hearts and, and minds in, in, this, in this conversation? Well, you know, as a non-scientist, you know, I really uh, lean into the experience of communities and how they are affected by a changing climate. Um, I live in California, as I mentioned before, and California is on fire. Um, and um, the consequences in people's lives to live through experiences, especially communities that are low income or have very limited access, um, really makes the conversation about climate be less of an academic exercise and one of, you know, how, how can we help communities be more resilient? Um, and how and how and, and and sadly it's a defensive position that some of our communities find ourselves in. Um, I think about the Gulf Coast, um, uh, uh, New Orleans, for instance. You know, these are frontline communities uh, whose lived experiences are directly. I mean, they, there are few places that you know people who live in those those climates and in those biomes can go. They can't pack up and go to higher ground necessarily. Um, and so it's been it's been difficult uh, for me to bridge the divide between one that feels very very heavy academic to the the lived experience where people are really trying to figure out what the next twenty years of their lives might look like as the, as as the planet changes and and reacts uh, to to the, the the climate that we're in right now. Awesome. And Tim, how about you? Where where you know, if, if, uh, where do you sort of, uh, how do you think about this sort of a question? Uh, you know, one of the things you and I've chatted about a bit is the sort of, you know, on biodiversity issues, um, it's less clear kind of what the asks are of government. And so, you know, uh, you talked a bit about it in relation to long-term thinking in capitalism, and long-term investment. But yeah, where, where do you think, how do you sort of fit climate change in with, with biodiversity? I, re I, I regret two things from this evening. The first is actually riffing on capitalism. The second was mentioning sandals, uh, because I've noticed that quite a lot of the chat has actually been picking up on both those words. <laughs> my, honest, my honest response, free of capitalism and sandals, is that when human beings start talking about conservation, they don't seem to understand that there's a pretty powerful agent out there called the natural world, which is rather better at it than we are. And human beings are woeful at understanding biodiversity, the interconnection of things. I had the privilege, I have the privilege of being involved with a 10,000 acre uh, project in Costa Rica, which was 42 farms, completely degraded, nothing, nothing living on it, 10,000 acres. It was bought by a philanthropist who wanted nothing to do with it except put a fence around it and said the birds will crap it back to life. Now, 30 years on, it is an absolutely astonishing secondary rainforest. Just three weeks ago, the very first jaguar was spotted in there, uh, but that's actually kind of like a poster kid. The really interesting thing is that the town of Paquera of 8,000 souls just outside the boundary of this rainforest had a celebration because it now boasts four rivers running 365 days a year whereas 30 years ago, there were murders caused by five months of drought a year. The natural world is cool. It is really terrific. But the poisonous thing is so many rich people at the moment are sponsoring some of the world's biggest NGOs to buy land, buy it, buy it, buy it, get people off it. We're going into another period of effing colonialism to buy land, then taking people off it that actually should be on it We've got to stop this romantic notion of the wild. 
the wild is a place that somehow humans shouldn't be in. We've got to find a way of being in the wild, sympathetic with it and realizing that it will provide an awful lot for us. That's not a romantic notion. It is an observed reality. When you go to a, a reef, I have been to a reef in Aldabra in the middle of the Indian Ocean where there's been no fishing since the year 1963. You go in it and you can't believe it because it's a bit like you feel Disney has taken it over. The proportion of top level uh, apex predators to the tiny fish on the reef is exactly proportionate, but we've never seen it because we've overfished everywhere else. But nature can put it back. We should just trust the planet we're on to be able to heal us. If only we would stop interfering, just make laws which make it criminal, treasonous to poison the ocean because it belongs to all of us and the same for the air and the same for the land, and we will be in a pretty good place. Tim, I really appreciate what you just said. You know, I, I back in 2014, we were coming up on the 50th anniversary in the United States of the Wilderness Act. And uh, around the same time, nearly exactly the same time, the Civil Rights Act was, was signed into law. And I feel like we missed a moment a moment where those two caucuses, had they talked to one another, they would see the common imperative and urgency to protect vulnerable people and vulnerable places. And had we done so, we might have a very different looking environmental movement, if you will, had we made those connections earlier. But it's not too late. And I really appreciate your comment about helping us to see that humans in our connection to these places and our relationship to these places is not necessarily a bad thing. It's that relationship that will bring about the transformative change, but also restore our human need for joy and love and connection that everyone and the planet needs. Amazing. Well, um, we've been inundated with questions, many of them not about sandals, which is, which is, which is fantastic. Um, and uh, I've just screwed up my screen. So oh, there we go. Um, and um, so I'm going to, I don't know if Maria is on and uh, can tell me, uh, we've got a great question from Michael Tesla. Um, I don't know if Michael wants to pipe up and speak. Maybe he's not allowed to, uh, <laughs> the rules of, of Zoom. But um, I'll, I'll, if Maria doesn't shout, who's brilliantly helping us organize this, I'll read out Michael's question for, for both of you. Michael says, I'm 27 years old and founder of a tech entertainment startup here in Los Angeles. I'm also an elected local council member for Hollywood and constantly looking for ways to connect the dots back to protecting our planet and uplifting our community. And his question is, how can we guide a new generation of businesses to instill a sense of social entrepreneurship and environmental justice into their business models? Great question. Um, don't know who wants to take that first. Rue, maybe, as a... As a, as a uh, an American uh, speaking to speak to Michael. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, not at all to be flip, but it sounds like your values are there. So it's it's a simple equation of be, do, have, um, and we have you know incredible ways of, of resourcing uh, or, or or connecting these networks of people who care about exactly what you care about, and being in California especially. Um, I'd love if there's ways that I can, you know, be a facilitator of connections, um, I'm happy to. But I mean, you, you're starting off on the right foot with some of the great values, as well as the location and the proximity you have to those networks that have those deep celebrity and technological networks. I mean, you know, Tim, we've touched on this already so far, but it is such a big, a big question. You know, you talked about the role of government in, which I totally agree with, in sort of setting a framework in which long-term action is is rewarded, not penalised, and so on. But it, absent that, you know, if you're a social entrepreneur or an entrepreneur sort of starting out or running a business, is there anything you, you would sort of advise them to to be doing to 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 make a positive difference on this? Besides, you know, please try not to dump your waste in the ocean on a on a Saturday <laughs> on a Saturday morning. Yeah, stop being a child. Stop being a child and forgiving yourself for shit. Too many people have that kind of like guilty smile on their face about not doing it quite right, but I do try as if it was kind of like a joke. It isn't a joke. 
And actually people have got to realize that there are two conversations to have in your life. One is you perhaps as a consumer, but by far the most important one is you as a citizen. And you should always start with me as a citizen and then allow yourself to be a consumer thereafter. I don't believe it. I don't believe that somebody who's ethically driven, whether they're capitalist or non-capitalist, could run a business that trashes the environment. It should not be possible to do so. It should be something that is kind of soul treason. You know, it, 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 uh, you're making it sound as if, oh, I'd really love to do that. I'd really love to be a bit like that. Well, be it for F sake. Stop. It's like someone talks they talk about being in an ngo or a charity as if somehow we ought to clap that you're in an ngo or a charity i've met more vain unscrupulous corrupt people working in ngos and, and charities than i ever have in business we've got to get real to where the world is it's just about who you are the institutions are not inherently good or bad it's the people who colonize them and i think that's why Picking up on what Ruth said earlier, why now is so important is I think we're being given a window, a line in the sand maybe, to actually, those of us who've been perhaps too quiet and not unreasonable enough, to actually just say, stop it, mate. Come on. <laughs> yeah, so true. A comment that's just popped up as well while uh, while Tim was speaking, I think in response to, to Ruth Peebles, just, it just writes, someone just wrote, Ruth needs to be cloned. Someone else has just written Sir Tim Smith, the Prime Minister. So, um, so <laughs> I think both of which, by the way, as solutions for the biodiversity crisis would be, would be fantastic. Um, question uh, that's, that's, uh, that's come through is, um, is about, uh, the, the title of this event is Rebelling Against Extinction. Uh, the question is, uh, what do you think we should be doing to rebel? Now, I know you've, you've touched on this throughout your throughout your talks, but um, Rue, I wonder if you could sort of take, take that on as sort of, you know, what in the coming week can, can the people uh, tuning in perhaps to, you know, do to, do to rebel? Well, uh, back to what I said earlier about relationships. I think we need to make new friends. You know, I think that as long as we're, we're hoping for change, but still having the same people in our circles, doing business the same way, not willing to look at different points of view, um, we're not going to move and, and, and get anywhere. I can't tell you how many times I get questions that go along the lines of, you know, how can I get more, you know, brown people to attend my program? You know, and the fundamental challenge of that question is because it's not really looking inside, it's looking for some external set of discrete steps that if you follow them, you'll have a different outcome. And it just doesn't work that way. We really have to also think about how we can exchange or even give up power and privilege to others who may, yeah. not, have, who may not have access to it. And so until we're really able to be in true, mutually beneficial relationship with people outside of our bubble, because the people who are on one end of the spectrum are, some, are just as guilty as those on the other end of the spectrum of being in your amen section and never being challenged to do or be different. Um, and I appreciate Tim's comments about NGOs and not-for-profits. Those are not a panacea of goodness that as we've experienced many times. And so character matters, uh, being honest matters and being in relationship and true relationship with people outside of your amen corner is essential. Mm -hmm. And that, I, that's what I've challenged myself to do this year. I'm, I'm doubling down on nuance. I wanna make new friends. I wanna be around people who have differing points of view because that's, that's generative. You know, the edges of forest, that's, that's generative. Um, and that's where I think most of us need to gravitate to. Beautiful. Well, look, last question for me, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll let everyone get on with rebelling and, and, and making a difference in their, in their lives. Um, so the question that's come in from Anonymous, possibly not their real name, but um, is um, what gives you hope? So Tim, aside from Rue, uh, what, <laughs> what, gives you, what gives you hope? Well, someone I know said to me that the wrong question is being asked by saying, what sort of planet are we giving our children? 
the question we should be asking is what sort of children are we giving the planet? <laughs> I, I believe that to be fundamentally true. And you know, whenever I want a shot in the arm, I, I have a young son who's 25 and I've also got a program with, with schools and I go into schools and I'm just shocked, absolutely shocked at how smart some of these youngsters are. The way we've allowed ourselves to demonize youth it's like we've become a whole bunch of old farts ahead of our time so that we think that the current youthful generation are not capable of stuff. They really are marvelous. And I think we ought to just make every possibility available to them to do what we should have done. Um, I don't think we've got any right. Well, no, Rue, you have, you're young. But uh, people of my generation, I'm 66, I feel ashamed of my generation really for actually not have, having had the moral compass to fight harder, to do things because Everybody wanted to belong to an establishment and it's a core weakness. It's just a weakness in our soul. And I think actually youngsters are calling us out and I'm delighted. I love being slapped around the face by youngsters telling me it's my fault. And it just inspires me to get better. Uh, and so I am extremely hopeful. And I think we're living at probably the most exciting time since humans came down from the trees. Honestly, I really mean that. Beautiful. Amazing. Rue, how would you, how would you take that as a, as a designated young person, uh, how would you? I never think, that's the thing about the environmental movement. You can be 49 and still be in the youth category. I love it, I'll take it. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, in any case, I, I have a lot of hope uh, in technology um, and, and the access, the, that the, the leveled playing field of access to technology as a platform to uh, create uh, and to disseminate and to shift narrative and to get the word out. Um, and it, it, it has democratized in a lot of ways, movements that would have taken perhaps longer or not have been able to, to, to grow um, at the scale in, that, in, the, in the way that they are able to. I, that's how Outdoor Afro was able to grow. And adjacent to that is leadership. I think there's a growing awareness that we need people to be decision makers, that it's not about adding on uh, people or ideas at the tail end. Uh, to Tim's point earlier, it's about bringing people in early, early because true innovation really starts with the design, not later, okay? So there's a growing awareness of that. There's a growing awareness of, of the need for leadership to be at the design phase. And then there's just incredible access now to technology and media that really help to amplify into audiences that otherwise wouldn't have access to this information or be able to author their own points of view and share with the world. Mm. Amen to that. Well, listen, I, we literally could talk for <laughs> hours, particularly if we were all in the, in the same room and had some, had a few drinks around as well. But, you know, I'm conscious of everyone's time. I'm particularly conscious of Rue and, and Tim's time and so grateful to them for, for donating uh, an hour or so to, to this conversation. And, you know, really, you know, I, I take many things from it, but ultimately a sense of kind of hope. And, and, and particularly, I think, you know, both, both Rue and Tim have said, stop banging on about, you know, to stop talking about doing stuff, do things, you know, and it's in all of our power, whether it's about getting out into nature, whether it's about changing what your company does, whether it's about calling out bad behavior of a company or a, a politician, we can do things, we really can, it's absolutely in our power. And I, I take that away from this conversation. And I'm so grateful to, to Tim and Rue for, for providing that inspiration and, and doing so much um, every day that makes a difference. This is, I hope, going to be the first in a whole bunch of things we do with the Eden Project to, to engage uh, entrepreneurs and, and, and innovators on, on this agenda. Uh, it's also the latest in our series with the Bruin Institute, uh, who are doing excellent work to promote diverse ideas and, and debates. So a huge thank you to, to Rachel and the Bruin Institute. But above all, to Rue and Tim, if you look up Outdoor Afro, go to the Eden Project website, there's ways of donating, there's ways of volunteering, there's ways of getting involved, you know, please do that. It's, uh, it will make your, it will fill your life with even more love and joy and fun. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.